Welcome to Trot Talk, an equestrian conversation with the American Saddlebred Horse Association. I'm your host, Tuffy Owens. For our podcast, we're exploring the equestrians behind the horses, influencers in the industry, sharing their stories and giving a leg up to our community. Well, thanks for tuning in to Trot Talk, everybody. We're here at Cardigan Farm. So excited to welcome Carson Cressley as our guest today. Carson, thanks for joining us. Of course. I love to um, talk about anything American Saddlebred, and I love that you came to me. I know. We're we're on location. This is our first uh, on location going to someone's farm. Yeah. Amazing. Now, I know you're probably really nervous, but have you finally made it now that you're on Trot Talk with Tuffy? I think so. I think so. Well, at least you won't have to work like super hard to work Saddlebreds into the conversation today since this is no. put together by the ASHA, but I mean... How do you get that done? Like, you've ridden horses onto a TV set with like, Nate Burkus, that interview a long time ago. But how do you kind of always work that in there? Uh, I always try to. I mean, I always think I'm like an evangelist for like saddlebreds <laughs> because I'm so passionate about them that anytime there's an opportunity, yeah. you know, you find a little like, you know, nook or cranny mm-hmm. to work your way in and I don't know what we were doing on a show and and I was like we could ride a saddlebred on to set and I don't even tell them it's a saddlebred I just say I have a horse yeah, right. or I have a farm like come visit yeah. and then once I lure them here or talk <laughs> them into the horse segment Absolutely. then I get on set and then I say well this is an American saddlebred and they're you know America's oldest breed and they're incredible and then I do the five second, you know, spiel. Now we're on a 300 acre piece of property here. It's beautiful. We're looking out the windows, sitting by the fire. It's a beautiful November day here in the Lehigh Valley, but everybody associates you with this New York City life and, right. and rightfully so. A, a ton of your life happens right there, but but this is home right yeah. here in the Lehigh Valley, right? Uh, tell us a little bit about growing up here in the Allentown area and uh, what life was like as a uh, little Carson. Yes, LC. El Cezy, that's what they used to call me Absolutely. back on the playground. Um, no, I, yeah, I've lived in New York City um, more than I've actually lived here because I moved there in 1991. And I actually, little known Carson fact, I worked for the American Horse Shows Association when it was not the USEF. I was like literally a country bumpkin getting off the bus <laughs> um, and not knowing. I was like, which way does 42nd Street go? They're like, both ways. Uh <laughs> And uh, I found my way to work, and that was my entree to New York City, and that was, like I said, in 1991. So I've lived there a very long time, uh, but I did grow up in outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania, in a very rural setting, which uh, Tuffy is getting to see right now. And um, my grandparents were really the ones that got us into horses, and we lived a little bit closer to town, but still in the country, and they had a pony farm. And um, my grandmother uh, grew up on a working farm and I always say we're practically Amish. We're Pennsylvania German. And we are like very like rustic, rustic, rugged farm people. And she grew up with giant workhorses. And when you're a child and, and you love horses, but they seem kind of um, utilitarian, all she wanted was a pony. Yes. So in the 1950s, when my dad was, I think he was like, you know, like a teenager, she was like, you want a pony, right? And he's like, no, not really. She's like, you're getting one. <laughs> And one turned, <laughs> yeah, one turned from like one to two to four to six and ah. geometric progression happened. And they had about 200 ponies by the mid sixties. And, um, they were a big giant pony farm, Cressley's pony farm. And they had yeah. production sales once okay. or twice a year and they would put up tents and people would come from all over the country and buy some really nice Shetland ponies. I don't know if you yeah. saw when you walked in, there's a painting of a golden Shetland pony my grandparents bought in the 50s from Terry McKenzie okay. from Diamond Pony Farm. Uh, so I was always kind of Shetland adjacent pony. to yeah. saddlebreds. And when we would show, and we showed at a very modest, we would go to the Quentin Riding Club, and sometimes we'd go to Devon. Mm-hmm. And back then it was a little easier to kind of, you know, we had a trainer named Ann Regal who had some really nice Morgans and thoroughbreds, and we would go to local shows and, um, you know, had some, like, that was a thing you right? could go. And, um, but at those local shows, I think it was probably the Quentin riding club. Yeah. Um, I saw people riding saddlebreds and in the reverse of my grandmother's story, I was like, ponies are cool, but, uh, can I get one of those? <laughs> uh, because they were so, I mean, the tails were so pretty and they had shiny black feet and the people were wearing great outfits. And I said, yeah. 
I need to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's my speed. So that was probably around like 13. And um, I think I've never not had a saddle bread since then. And I just turned 50. No, I don't buy it. I swear. Look out, Masters Division. Here I come. Well, yeah, once we have the Saddlebred Masters, but for now, you could go to Oklahoma and show at the Morgan Grand National. It's on my list. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, so you started off with the Saddlebreds. You're about 13 years old. Well, what was that like? Did you stick with the same trainer and show locally with those, or did you start going up the ladder? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that when you when you get a taste of showing Saddlebreds, you obviously want to do your very best, so... We started with a local trainer like so many people do, and I discovered them at a horse show because that's, you know, what I really believe our breed does best. And um, it was actually at a place called Bluegate Farm, which is about five minutes from here. My grandparents used to own that farm as well, and a saddlebred trainer there named Gail Person, um, Person's Riding Club in Allentown, PA, started many people, Um, and that's how we started. And we had funny moments like – I remember going to a horse show and all of the buggies falling off the roof of the trailer because we didn't really know what we were doing. You know, some of our outfits were probably crazy and uh, we didn't have the best stock and sometimes they would run away. I had a three-gated horse called I've Got It who definitely did not have it. And uh, anytime it was – and these were the days like in the 80s when there was like 14 or 15 horses in a local junior exhibitor three-gated class for riders 15 to 17. And my horse did not canter the second direction. He would just turn around and spin. So I remember just hearing, don't get near that guy. (laughs) Um, So that was my growing up. But you learn and you want to do more. And then we were lucky. There was a lot of saddlebred trainers in Pennsylvania. Um, And we moved our horses to Jimmy Orfanos. And um, he was really just starting out then. And we had some, you know, accidentally very nice horses that we didn't realize we had. And um, went to, you know, bigger horse shows, went to Eastern States, went to Spring gotcha. Premier, went to um, Devon, mm-hmm. um, those types of places. And then um, had horses with him, had horses with Skip Schenker for like oh, 35 yeah, yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and he's a really, he's a master horse person in every regard. And then um, Jan Lukens. And I really, I've had horses everywhere. Yeah. Um, Johnny Jones and Don Harris and um, Melinda Moore. I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, Meryl Murray, um, yeah. everywhere, and um, just always try to have, you know, nice stock, but also have fun with it and enjoy the process, and we That's breed cool. some horses here. Um, so, yeah, it's supposed to be fun, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got your retirement horses right out there, uh, fight nights down there in a green blanket down at your sister's farm. Now, how did she get into it? Did she did she get into it with you? Yeah, we both, uh, my sister and I both started riding at Bluegate Farm together, okay. right five minutes down the road. Right. And, um, and she grew up showing ponies as well. She showed them more than I did and showed roadsters and, uh, you know, was at the Syracuse horse show like in 19, in the seventies. Um, I'm much too young for that. (laughs) Um, but, um, so we've been doing it as a family for always. Well, it's such a great family thing. And I mean, we can, we can see her farm right, right down the hill there. Um, but, but what, what were you like as a kid? Uh, did you have other hobbies other than horses and the ponies and all that? No, not really. Not I was pretty obsessed. Um, I think by the time I was like 13, my routine was go to school, try not to get beat up, um, <laughs> insert sad ABC after school special here. And, um, and then I would come home and I would go to the barn. There used to be like a black beauty show on TV in oh, the okay, afternoons yeah. and I would watch that Perfect. and, uh, and then I would go um, do horse stuff. I, I can distinctly remember like cutting school, which is don't do it, kids. Stay in school. And driving in my um, little red convertible with La Isla Bonita by M- Madonna playing on my cassette deck um, to leave early and go to the barn. And we really did everything ourselves back then. Like it was a boarding place and there was a trainer, but – we, you know, I would be putting stretchies on and like trotting up a hill to the ring, like by myself, like incredibly dangerous things that you shouldn't be doing. But it was, you know, it was the 80s. We didn't know any better. Exactly. Didn't know any there better. would be days where like, I think it'd be really fun if we tried to switch mounts while we line up next yeah. to each other. Like not getting on the ground, but just yeah, going and from just one horse to the other. Stuff like that. But we all lived. 
<laughs> and here we are. Well, yeah, for, for the people that are still here, I mean, the rest of them, we don't we don't know where those bodies are sure. buried. Sure. Yeah, but the AHSA job, now USCF, you, you graduate college, go right to work at the AHSA? Is, was it a way to get to New York? Yeah, yeah. I had a friend, and she'd actually um, ridden with Jan Lukens. Her name was Lori Drews, okay. and she was working at the American Horse Shows Association and kind of overseeing all the Saddlebred, Hackney, Morgan mm-hmm. disciplines. She was having a baby and was going to be leaving her job. And I was like, wait a minute, that job's in New York City, right? And I, I know all about horses because at that point I had been showing for a long time. And um, yeah, I graduated like May 5th, 1991. And like May 6th, I moved to New York City. So where did you go to college? I went to Gettysburg College here in Pennsylvania. I have a degree in finance. I have no idea. I don't even know how to like work QuickBooks, but I have a degree in finance and Perfect. fine art. Oh, and fine art. Okay, yeah. double major. I like yeah. that. Well, well, now we know where little Carson, Elsie, came from. Uh, when we come back from our commercial break, we'll talk a little bit more about what you're doing now, yeah. some of the horses you have, things you're excited about going forward. Trot Talk wouldn't be possible without the support of the United States Equestrian Federation. USEF is dedicated to uniting the equestrian community, honoring achievement, and serving as guardians of equestrian sport for every horse lover. Discover more about the USEF by checking out their website, usef.org. Well, welcome back to Trot Talk here with Carson Cressley at Cardigan Farm, sitting in this beautiful little sitting area. Uh, the formal dining room's right over there, but uh, but we do have a beautiful view here. I think we're in the breakfast nook. Oh, this is the breakfast nook. If this were okay. a game of Clue, we'd be in the breakfast the nook breakfast with nook. Colonel Mustard. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing, uh, things you can talk about here, like current business oh, involvements, other sure. things like that. Well, I mean, we're recording this holiday season 2019, and um, I have a new show on Freeform, which used to be ABC Family. Okay. And I was like, are you sure you want me? <laughs> um, and it's called Rap Battle. Rap Battle. And uh, I collaborated, collaborated with this producer before. We did a couple other shows called Skin Wars and Window Warriors. We, um, This same guy, Michael Levitt, and I okay. um, were talking about this. And there were 75 baking shows on TV. And we're like, yeah. why is there not something about like – either like holiday decor or yeah. something. And he's like, well, what about gift wrapping? I was like, I'm down. Yeah, let's go. And um, so, yeah, we've had a great uh, launch mm-hmm. and we're on for the entire holiday season awesome. on Mondays from uh, 9 to 11. Bye. So that's December. And then in January in the new year in 2020, our 12th season of RuPaul's Drag Race will oh, air. 12 seasons. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 12 seasons and like 17 Emmys. Um, there's one right there. I see. Um, and, um, so that'll be coming back and we did, um, a regular season, an all-star season and a new celebrity edition, which I was just like, I don't know, how's that going to work? And, um, it worked really well. So, well, good. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's what's going on in, in TV land. Well, and, and let's say for uh, Big Carson, uh, BC. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. (laughs) We'll do that. Uh, what about horses? Are you, are you breeding? Uh, what are you doing? I mean, I think it's so important. I mean, you know. We were earlier lamenting that we're losing some large breeders, and I think it's so important for – if you can breed a horse, and, and obviously it's a huge financial and time commitment, right. and you want to make sure that you know there's a place for that horse um, after you've raised it. Uh, but I think it's really important for people to uh, breed horses. Yeah. Um, we, we definitely need that in our industry. So we have about, I think I have four brood mares, um, and mostly like retired show horses, yeah. um, a horse that, um, my sister showed that did really well called Espresso Love and, um, some other ones that we've raised and some like grand children of horses, show horses that we've had for a hundred years. Yeah. Um, we usually keep those and then keep them as brood mares. So, I have those and some youngsters out and about at Melinda Moore. I have a really nice some more filly that I keep nearby at Broadmoor with um, Mike Gobig and Dwayne Knowles. I love that you talked them into taking a saddlebred. Like, no, 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 but you talked them into it. I did. I wore them down for years, (laughs) and um, they do such a great job. And they might talk me into a Morgan. It's it's highly unlikely, (laughs) 
Um, just because, you know, Saddlebreds are so great. Yeah. And that's, that's the bar that I compare everything to. I'm like, mm. Well, they're the most extreme of what we do. They're, they're just like the, the epitome of a saddle seat horse, all that neck. I also like their feel and their minds, though. I mean, I, I've ridden many different breeds. I mean, we have, um, you can see there's a team penning arena down oh, there. Yeah. For reining horses and barrel horses. So I've been around lots of quarter horses recently. I've ridden Frisians. I've ridden Morgans. I do feel like saddlebreds really are like the Rolls Royce. Like yeah. just their temperament, their looks, their mouths, the way they ride. Like they're the best. Well, the next Sorry. thing I was going to ask you was uh, what has kept you in the saddlebred business continuously for all these years. But I think. I, you know, they're, they're the gold standard for me. Like if yeah. you want a saddle seat horse. And I will tell you, I have, you know, not every horse that we raise, you know, becomes a great horse. I've, right. I've sold some right. nice ones. Um, and we've had some Rose Lane's Angelo, who went on to be yeah. amazing. And Sir Silver Knight, who went on to win the 3 Gated World Grand Championship. Um, these are all horses that we've either raised or owned or sold. Yeah. So we have some nice ones. But even the ones that don't make, you know, world beater show horses mm – -hmm. I have a Thundergun Colt who's probably like seven now. I ride him all over this farm. Really? He is the most solid citizen, uh, but yet he's elegant. I mean, he's, he's elegant, but he has a job. And he has a job, and he's so good about it, and he feels so good underneath. Like, he's just a solid, great, amazing trail horse. So, you know, our breed really can do everything, too. So Very that's what I like to, you know, ride when I'm riding around at home or – obviously at a horse show. Yeah. That's what I like. What's kind of been your uh, biggest challenge along the way as far as your equestrian life? Um, uh, cantering? <laughs> no. Um, I uh, challenge, I think the challenge has always been, I mean, everybody's in search of that elusive horse. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's hard to find nice horses and it's expensive that, mm -hmm. you know, I wish yeah. it weren't as, um, I wish it were more affordable just for everybody, accessibility. And then I think, you know, having access to, you know, places to practice and ride. I mean, I grew up after we left, you know, kind of a local kind of do-it-yourself place. Our horses were five hours away, you know, with Skip Schenker. So right, right. that was – that's a big challenge when you never ride. Mm -hmm. And that is still my, my challenge, although I have some, you know, horses locally and I'm so thrilled that you guys are here. In the area, yeah. Never having – now it's never having time. So, like, I'll get on a horse at a horse show and be like, you look like you've never ridden that before. I'm like, I haven't. Well, the good thing is that you've been you know, successful enough to maintain this uh, equestrian lifestyle. The bad thing is that you've had to work this hard to, you know – I know. People are like, why don't you – why were you not at Louisville this year? I'm like, because I was making rap battle. And they're like, well, you need to tell them to take off. I was like – if I said no to a TV project, I would not be able to exactly. show this horse that I'm on right now. Exactly. So you have to – I think there's always um, sacrifices, unfortunately. But I've always done it when I had no money and when I had more. And we really need to um, support that as an industry. Absolutely. What are a couple of successes that you've had in the horse business that you're especially proud of? Oh, gosh, successes. Um, well um, – I mean, we everybody gauges like success a lot of times by Louisville, and I think there are many other places where you can feel really successful. That being said, though, winning at Louisville is pretty great. I, I had a very nice horse that I bought as a two-year-old called Enchanting Memories mm -hmm. um, from Roberta Rasour and, and Johnny Jones and Trey Lee were training her at the time, and she was really spectacular. It was my first like major, major horse. Yeah. So she was really, really fun because I got to see her as a three-year-old and a junior horse. And then um, I got to show her myself. And it took a long time. It was not easy. I thought like, oh, I'll buy like a great horse and then I'll just go to Louisville and win. No. No, it took years. But I d got it done there you go. in 2009. And um, it was a great thrill. And probably the, the thing I'm most proud of is that Gail Lampy said after the class, she's like, Oh, you gave them a riding lesson. I was like, I did? Um, so I must have been good that day. Yeah, it must have been good for Gail to say something. That was really fun. Um, of course, supporting and watching my niece show through her junior oh, yeah. exhibitor career. We had great horses like Harrison Ford, who's still out there. The best, oh, yeah. kindest. That horse never put one foot out of place his entire life. And it was one of those stories where we were looking for a horse and looking for a horse and looking for a horse. I had other horses with Don Harris at the time. Oh, okay. And uh, and Morgan was nine years old. And like, why don't you buy Harrison Ford? I'm like, for a nine-year-old? Uh, but for a nine-year-old, that was yeah, really pushing still, it. Yeah. 
But it was really, really cute because she showed 10 and under equitation. I think her last class was at the Shelbyville Horse Show, I don't know, 10 years ago. Right. And that walk and trot class was on a Wednesday. And then she showed Harrison Ford in a five-gated class like on a Thursday. I mean, the horse is a, the best thinking horse in the world. He would never try anything, but they did get a little rapid at times. <laughs> he got excited, uh, exuberant. He's been a great horse. Um, buying and selling, you know, finding prospects. I mean, you know, uh, Sir Silver Knight, obviously, that I got to sell to a great friend who went on to have amazing success. Mm -hmm. um, winning the Reserve World Grand Championship with Attaché's Crown Royal um, that I owned um, in partnership with Annika at the time that I saw at a horse show and I was like, this horse is really cool. And yes, I saw him do some hair raising things. Um, and I've been on him when he did some hair raising things, but I, I was second in the amateur stallions and geldings at Kansas city with him. Um, he was, I mean, that thing is like a freight train. He is a big, powerful animal. He was like a truck. Yeah. Um, Just, great horse, yeah. great attitude, cool, athletic. Yeah. Yeah. He's a really special individual yeah. fight night. Um, who I bought, kind of for myself and then gave to my niece. He is an incredible horse to ride. I, I was telling you earlier, I rode him at the farm and that was a little too exciting for my blood. Um, and he's here retired as a bunch are. Yeah. Um, and then raising some nice horses. Where a Tierra, who's done really well at Louisville. I just sold a horse to Kelly Craigle called Cardigan Conundrum, um, who's really beautiful. And he's a Western horse and he's stunning. Um, and, um, we raised a horse that won um, the Park Pleasure Stake at Kansas City with Robert Gardner last year. So anytime something you raise actually goes to a big oh, horse yeah. show and wins, I don't even care what class it is. It's quite yeah. thrilling yeah. because you just don't imagine that something that came from here, from very right. humble beginnings, would go to a big horse show and get a, you know, a great prize. So that's fun. Yeah, I think those are some of the highlights. Well, yeah, that was a that was a pretty good highlight list. Uh, well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about going forward in the horse business and what you see as the future for the American Saddlebird business. Be right back with Carson Cressley. The American Saddlebred Horse Association is a proud sponsor of our show, Trot Talk, and is devoted to the success of all American Saddlebreds. The ASHA strives to maintain the integrity of the breed while providing a variety of programs to foster public awareness. Interested in learning more? Search ASB Dreams on Instagram or follow us at Saddlebred Horse ASSOC. Let's get back to the show. Well, welcome back to Trot Talk here with Carson Cressley of Cardigan Farm talking a little bit about going forward in the American Saddlebird business. What is something that you haven't accomplished yet that you've always wanted to or you'd like to moving forward? Oh, well, just uh, I would love to I would love to win all three of the gentlemen classes at Louisville. That is has always been my goal. I've been second in the walk trot class many times. <laughs> I've been second in the fine harness class, I think once or twice. Well, now for the fine harness class, you get money for being second. Uh, Lana and Daryl Gilpin for Larry Gilpin, oh, they get did to they give like do that? $500 for the reserve world champion in amateur gentlemen's fine harness. You just get, well, here's some money and a trophy. Well, that'll get me yeah, there. Yeah, now you got to be second, but I, I feel like you might still be shooting for the blue ribbon. I, I think I would like to win that. So <laughs> I have a plan for next year. So. Oh, really? Yeah, if you're a fine harness driver, look out, <laughs> because I don't know what I'm doing. No, I, I do. I do. Don't worry. I'm not dangerous, I swear. I think there's two things. Um, I would love to, yeah, I would love to win those two classes at Louisville. That's a that's a pipe dream, and you can, you know, spend a lot of money and a lot of time, and it still might not happen. So you just have to go and, like, have a wonderful ride or drive and enjoy the experience. I'm excited to wear some amazing outfits. Um in fine, in fine harness, harness yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Get a more there. yeah. I'm seeing some Dolce and Gabbana in my future, my um, but um, so those are like you know show ring goals. Yeah. I, you know, continuing to raise horses, I think, mm -hmm. is really important, and you have to be very careful about how you manage it, or you can have like a hundred. <laughs> and we have many. Yeah, um, many we have, out there we have many lawn ornaments. <laughs> um, I think raising some nice horses would be a great goal. And then when you mentioned Larry. Um, and Lana Gilpin, they were great friends of mine. Yeah. And I think that's what's so special about our industry. The real jewel, we work with amazing horses that are the most athletic, kindest, smartest, elegant, 
many superlatives. We have the best product in the in the equine biz, but our people um, and the families and the generations. Um, and you know, I grew up, you know, admiring people like Sally Wheeler, these great grand dames, and then yeah. their family is still doing it. And I'm kind of the same age as Kenny and Seal, mm-hmm. and my niece is friends with Catherine, and it's just. That's the real the real joy of this business is that every horse show is like going to a family reunion. Oh, absolutely. And when you're all over the world and you're very untethered, coming back to that tradition and that um, sameness, like going back to Kansas City, it's a very difficult horse show in many ways, but it's like such a bomb because oh, yeah. it's like, oh, I, we go to the same restaurants and we see the same people and it's just, it really becomes um, an additional family and it's a amazing thing well it's got to be great for you to have that as an outlet though i mean it, it, now it was it, it was your whole life when you were a kid and you know working for the ahsa but i mean you have such you're you're everywhere i mean i i turn on my tv and there's carson okay now he's on this show and now he's on this show i'm a fame ho <laughs> uh no it's it's um it's all part of the job you have to go do all those things to promote your like tv stuff oh yeah but i am busy and you know, being mildly famous, like sometimes you're, you know, you're all over the place, like you said, and you're traveling. So it's nice to come home to here, mm-hmm. but also going to horse shows Go or horse shows. being with horse show people um, is like going home. Well, yeah, it's such a it's such a cool centering thing. And we were talking a little bit before about how you saw the horses at Quentin and Devin. Um, we don't really have I mean, we have Devin. Uh, we have like one or two horse shows where we right. actually get to show what we do to the public. But right. we had actually talked uh, before this, before we started recording about the digital end of it. Yeah. You know, to show what we do to people digitally and, and, and draw them in. Right. I mean, obviously, our product is amazing, the American Saddlebred. And what it does best, in my opinion and in many people's opinion, is be a show horse. And I don't care if it's a hunter show horse or the most amazing, slickest, racking, five-gated show horse or a Western show horse, or a walk and trot pleasure, we have the best show horse. And people years ago in the, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, horse shows were entertainment, yeah. and they drew big crowds. Um, and then you know options became, there's a multitude of entertainment options, and horse shows fell by the wayside. We don't live in as rural of an environment anymore. Horses are removed. When I grew up, there was a riding academy in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. There was a riding instruction stable five minutes from where I grew up. That's a little bit harder to find now. Um, but the thing – and discovery is really important. I think that's the biggest thing. I'm, I'm so grateful that Marty Schaffel is spear, spearheading the American Saddlebred Horse Association right now because I think he has so many great ideas about sharing what we have. And you have to – I've said this many times. Out. Yeah, yeah. Just exposure, exposure, exposure. Because unless you see it, you don't know it exists. Right. And unless you – see it you don't know that you want it right. you, you know there's a Ralph Lauren coat that I wore today I had to have it but <laughs> if I didn't see it in the store in the window I didn't know that I wanted it because it's not a utility item yeah, exactly. and our horses are a, a, a leisure item an, an extra money item a luxury item a fun item a toy mm-hmm. and we need to keep putting them in the window because when people see them they cannot help but be arrested and say, oh my gosh, what is that? Yeah. I want one of those. And that was my experience when I first saw them when I was you know, 10 years old mm-hmm. at the Quentin Riding Club in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Now with digital media, even though we have smaller audiences at our horse shows, uh, we can still share our horses with as many people all over the yeah. world through oh, yeah. Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and broadcasting horse shows and horse shows might be boring and that has been you know a criticism but we can still share the beauty and the athleticism and get people interested because once you get interested and you ride them and you get a taste of the competition most people want to do that yeah it's a lot more exciting when you're participating exactly <laughs> and maybe we're not a spectator sport anymore but we have the eyes of the world that we can show our amazing breed and nothing looks better on social media than a saddle bread i mean come on <laughs> Uh, what advice would you give to you know kids aging out, going off to college? They they want to start their career, but they they want to kind of like stay attached to it. Right. What I mean, what I mean, you did. Right. Yeah, I was really lucky. Even when I worked in New York City, and that was very challenging because again, there's no place to ride. Mm-hmm. Um, I would go, you know, two hours on the train up to Jan's, to Jan Lukens in Ravina, New York. But I always 
fortunately was able to have a show horse even while I was doing that. Yeah. Because I had parents who gave me money. <laughs> um, that's how that happened. Um, because I wouldn't have been able to really do it. Um, but there's so many things. Just being around saddlebred horses mm -hmm. is a connector. And we're all such a big family. So Jillian Schaefer, for example, who used to own Harrison Ford, she reached out to me on social media. She's living um, in Seattle. And she was like, I would love to ride. I was like, oh my gosh, go, you have to go to Deerdor Stables. They're yeah. Oh, yeah. right there in Wash in yeah. Oregon, Malala, Oregon. Malala. And um, they will, you know, she's like, well, they, you know, let me ride. I was like, we all love our horses so much that. Yeah, just say the words Harrison Ford and right. you'll be good. They will love to have yeah. you. And same thing around here. Like one of, um, uh, one of the riders for Saddle and Bridle is from this town. I was like, come over and ride. Yeah. Um, I have horses, I have an arena, like have at it. So I think that familial atmosphere, mm -hmm. no matter where you live, if, if you have access to a saddlebred facility, which is a real challenge and that's a problem we need to work on, people will welcome you with open arms and you can just be around them and trail ride or ride at home, take a riding lesson. Uh, keep going to horse shows as yes, you're, just you know, show, right. yes, make it your vacation. I mean, I would, you know, be shooting all week in California and I would go to like the Morgan Medallion in Santa Barbara <laughs> just so I could smell like shavings yes. and horse sweat right. and see a tack room. Well, and you got to go to Santa Barbara, which is not that. Know. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah, I announced that horse show for a few years and then it conflicted with another show. They, they moved their dates and it was one of the saddest professional things I ever had to do. Not going to Santa Barbara? <laughs> yes, it was terrible. Not going to Santa Barbara. Well, well, they moved it to Vegas now anyway. So. Right, yeah. which is also fun. Which is, yeah, that, that, that's fun in a different way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been to that too because, again, I'm that loser that like when I'm like either working or like whatever, yeah. I'll like go to a horse show. Like I can't – it's a busman's holiday. I can't help it. I was filming a project in North Carolina and I went to the North Carolina State Fair. <gasps> Just to like smell horses exactly. and be around the atmosphere. Well, that's exactly it. Just you know, just stay involved. Well, uh, we have stolen an idea from uh, every other podcast I've ever heard, which is the rapid fire, the lightning round questions. Okay, uh, you didn't hear them ahead of time. I did. So here we go. We asked them of all of our guests we've had so far. Um, greatest horse you've ever seen in person, any breed. Uh, in person, Imperator. Imperator? Yeah. So elegant. Oh, so beautiful. Beautiful. Slow get a hole in the ground. Greatest horse you've ever ridden or trained? Uh, I think the greatest horse I've ridden, oh gosh, that's according to Lynn. According to Lynn? That, yeah, that'd be an awesome one. That was a pretty spectacular ride. Yeah. That's yeah. A cool horse. That's very, cool. very fun. All right. The three people to dinner. If you could bring three people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? Oh gosh, uh, there's so again, there's so many to choose from. Doesn't have to be let's horse let's make it horse people though. <laughs> I mean, um, Tom and Donna Moore would certainly keep it interesting was, and spicy. Um, and then a third person. Um, did you remember Charlie Hatcher? And he used to train Sultan's Leather and Lace for Sherry Ort. And he was like a really old school, like old fashioned horseman yeah. from like the East Coast, old school. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think he would have some great That's stories. Awesome. So I think the three of them would be a triad of like, I, d I love hearing like old fashioned horse stories. Oh, for sure. For, for sure. And you know, about back in the day and how great horse shows were. And I thought you were going to go with Jim B as the third one. Oh, right? Jim B would be great too. I mean, I could go on. There's a list. I mean, uh, who wouldn't want to talk to like Garland Bradshaw, oh, absolutely. Um, which is why I think these podcasts are so important. And I think if we can get legends, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We now have the technology to preserve this history, um, you know, and to hear Don Harris's stories. I mean, I was lucky enough to be around some of these people, but not everybody is. So if we can preserve that, it would be amazing. Oh, yeah. I'd love to do one with Don Harris, except uh, I don't think we'd ever get the microphone back because once right. he has a mic, he just, he just goes. Craziest name you've ever seen for a horse? Oh, I can't even say it. It's so terrible. No. Yeah, I can't. Um, there's two of them, okay. um, but they're both they're they're too naughty for this podcast. <laughs> but they're actual names of horses. Yes. How did that happen? They have something to do with Nutcracker, but oh, they just no. sounded illicit. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. Go for it. One was Juice from the Nut. Oh boy. Is, oh boy. is that not terrible? Yep. I'm sorry to whoever named him. And yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, you you can't do much better than that. That is the answer to that question. A uh, favorite memory that you have as an equestrian? I mean, a really fun one was going to South Africa for 
the World Cup team in 1999. 99, wow. Yeah, we're old. I'm old. <laughs> and um, Vicky Gillenwater and Chris Reiser and Chris Nally and um, uh, Stacey Kipper and Janelle Chauvinac. Um, we had a great time. That sounds like a pretty good yeah. team. Yeah, I was a that was a crazy group. I think Fatima was with us as well. <laughs> um, it was very very fun. But I mean that entire team, all, all those people are are still involved. All those people still involved. Yeah. And and Ann Judd, I think, was like our well, Chris Reiser was our coach, I guess. Oh, Ann yeah. Judd was somehow involved. Yeah, in in some way, shape, or form. Um, all right, last one. If you could have one last meal, what would it be? Oh, I'm pretty simple. Um, uh, macaroni and cheese, so, so good. good. Yeah, so it's the best. <laughs> well, thank you, Carson. That wraps up this episode of Trot Talk. Thank you so much for joining us here. Well, inviting us here to your home You're here. So at welcome. Cardigan Farm. Come back anytime. Thank you all for listening to Trot Talk. We hope you enjoyed the ride. The ASHA is committed to promoting and protecting the American saddlebred horse for a brighter future full of ASB dreams. I'm Tuffy Owens. Keep listening and trot on.